what you folks have going on here is really is getting national attention. Uh, it's rather amazing, uh, almost out of nothing. The uh, this is getting known as a literary community, and it's getting noticed on the East Coast. It's getting noticed in a lot of the universities, uh, and perhaps that says something about the state of literature in the United States that a little goes a long ways, and especially if it's coming from a university. Uh, so Houston at Victoria is doing something that's getting noticed and uh, has the potential for, I think, having enormous impact uh, on literature in the United States uh, for years to come. So what am I doing here and how did uh, I get here? Uh, anybody who gets into publishing, who starts a publishing uh, operation, whether it's a magazine or a publishing house, usually is doing it out of a state of rage or anger. Just, <laughs> you're dissatisfied with the state of something or other, and you're going to, uh, you're not even planning on correcting it. You, you just want to uh, vent. Uh, and at times, the way you start venting uh, becomes relatively successful, and you run the risk of now you become part of that mainstream that you were objecting to. And so how do you uh, still maintain the counterculture uh, uh, intent that you had at the beginning without now just becoming something you'd be rallying against, railing against, uh, and making fun of uh, uh, at some other point? Well, that's been the challenge of uh, initially the journal I started and then the press, is how to keep reinventing itself and keep finding reasons for being outraged. Uh, what's wrong now and how are we going to respond to it? Uh, the review of contemporary fiction when I started it was really a response to how badly certain authors were being treated by the media, uh, critics in this country, and by academics. They weren't being talked about. And I wanted them talked about. I wanted to find out who else was interested out there in the country and wanted to be writing about them. And at the same time, I wanted them to be talked about and written about in a context, in an international context. So at that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, American writers were be beginning to see themselves as the only writers in the world. And they were certainly being viewed by critics as the only writers in the world. Uh, foreign writers were starting to be ignored. And my view was, as a reader, and mo most of what I've done has really been a response as a reader. Uh, my view was that any writer should be seen in the context of what else is going on in the world. Uh, that there's so much cross-fertilization that goes on among writers, and they learn from each other. And in order to understand any particular writer or movement, you really have to see what else has been going on uh, in the past as well as in the present. And the United States began to enjoy a period of it could ignore pretty much what was happening elsewhere. And that has only increased over the years. At the same time, publishing itself began to change. Up until the 1970s, major New York houses, publishing houses, were still being run by the founders. And they were hanging around. So Alfred Knopf, for instance, uh, was still running Knopf and was deciding what was being published by Knopf. That began to change in the late 70s and the 80s, and corporations began to take over these publishing houses. And a lot of the literature that they used to do began to disappear from their list. Uh, initially, books of drama uh, disappeared. I grew up reading drama as the way that one might read a novel. And the books were readily available from uh, the major publishing houses. Poetry started disappearing from those lists. Uh, experimental fiction started disappearing. Uh, books started going out of print, and eventually translations started disappearing. Now this created the possibility for small presses being able to publish authors they never had access to before, and to start to do things that uh, I think were really exciting. So some of the best books being published in the United States in the last several years have been done by the small presses. Uh, presses like Dalkey that started off without any money and uh, uh, without any business sense whatsoever, with a cause. And a lot of those presses have now become well-established, uh, institutionalized, and a major part of publishing in the U.S. 
and have begun to have effects abroad, especially in relation to translation. Translation has become more and more important to the press in the last few years because so few books from the rest of the world are making their way into the United States. Uh, we don't keep very good records in the United States about how many books are in translation, but the best figure is about 2.5% of the 250,000 books published in the United States are works in translation. But that's all books. Those are legal books, business books, how-to books, cooking books. If you restrict yourself to literary books, it becomes uh, the number this year for adult fiction and poetry is going to be about 400 books are coming to the U.S. in translation from the rest of the world. Uh, that kind of percentage compares with uh, 25 to 50 percent in all European countries are works in translation. Uh, Japan, 60 percent of the books published in Japan are works in translation. And a lot of those are coming from the English language, but also from a lot of other countries. So the United States in the last 30 years, because we've been able to, have, has, have, we've isolated ourselves from the literature of the rest of the world, but we've also managed to do it in other ways as well. Uh, that, I think, has political consequences. It's not my primary interest in the books that we publish, but we've uh, begun to occupy a strange political uh, position in this country without ever intending to. Uh, my primary interest is the art of literature, and publishing the best fiction and poetry that I can find throughout the world. But in doing so, we have been forced into almost taking a political stand about the United States and how isolated it's uh, become. So suddenly, without intending to, this position on art has become a, a political position. The uh, disinterest in the United States in translation uh, is not on the part of readers. I've never seen it uh, uh, show up with readers. It's on the part of the media, and it's on the part of bookstores. The assumption is if, if it's a work in translation, Americans will not be interested in it. And so the media will tend to um, not cover the book. Twenty years ago, because of uh, the shrinkage in coverage of translation, uh, I made up a letter and sent it out under a uh, pseudonym to book review editors throughout the United States. And it was signed by some fictitious figure named Patrice Rousseau. So I gave her a French name. And it was a rant, a page-long rant about the state of book reviewing in the United States. And sent it out and asked book review editors to respond to it. Uh, so the San Francisco Chronicle, Houston newspaper, St. Louis, every major newspaper throughout the US responded to it. And they responded, first of all, by attacking the French, because they assumed that this Patrice Rousseau was a French woman <coughs> in saying that things in France were no better than the United States. Every one of them, though, said it was not their responsibility to be reviewing these kinds of books because their readers weren't interested. Uh, it was the New York Times' responsibility as a national newspaper. But guess what the editor in the New York Times said? That their readership wasn't interested, and so it wasn't their responsibility. And the second reason given was that the book should really be reviewed in its original language rather than in translation. And the New York Times has a policy of not reviewing books in the original language because Americans don't know the language. So it became a very safe system, self-reinforcing system, to justify not covering uh, translation. Well, that has, it finally winds its way down to the bookstore level because the assumption is the books won't get covered in the media. Therefore, bookstores uh, will get books, not be able to sell them because nobody knows that, that they exist. And uh, therefore, publishers will do fewer such books. So we've gotten ourselves, as a country, into a terrible situation of just not knowing what's being written in the rest of the world. Uh, the press that I started and run uh, has, from the start, dedicated itself to finding writers throughout the rest of the world. And it's, uh, 
it's an exciting thing to do because you can find writers who, uh, oh, even going back 40 years, 50 years, did incredible books that nobody ever translated. And they're sitting out there waiting to be discovered in the English-speaking world. Uh, the contemporary writers that are doing things in some of the Eastern European countries, uh, in Japan, which I just got back from, the uh, uh, even within some of the major languages, such as Germany, uh, German and French, major works that were never done because they were too daring and too risk-taking have never been translated. And there's a whole new generation of French writers that are doing really interesting things that have almost no chance of ever seeing uh, light of day in the United States, unless publishers, small publishers usually, are going to undertake the challenge of doing them. And it is a challenge. You're up against the financial realities of uh, that all publishers are these days. Uh, in Japan, uh, there was a panel of uh, publishers from the United Kingdom and the United States and from uh, France talking about the state of uh, book selling. And the American publishers agreed that there's only six major accounts now in the United States that you have to sell books to. And it's Amazon is the obvious one, which is now the greatest source of uh, ordering books from us and every other publisher in the United States. Uh, and it's a kind of scary situation as Amazon has <laughs> taken over uh, uh, more or less the book world. You have a few wholesalers in the United States. Then you have Barnes and & Noble and you have Borders. And as you no doubt know with Barnes and & Noble and Borders, if Borders opened a store, Barnes and Noble would open them uh, down the street. So small cities in the United States that didn't have any bookstores suddenly had two mammoth bookstores. Uh, Borders is on the verge of collapse. How they've lasted this long, nobody knows. Uh, every month there's a forecast they're going to declare bankruptcy. And if they do, uh, publishers are going to be greatly hurt as the books come flooding back to them. Barnes & Noble has already announced plans that if Borders closes, well, Barnes & Noble is going to start closing all their stores that were in, opened in order to compete with Borders. So uh, all these kind of, uh, I think, for a while at least, is this wonderful situation in which we you know, had two large bookstores uh, in so many cities. We won't have any bookstores uh, once again. And small independents have been driven out of business in the meantime. Uh, Barnes & Noble is also, there's growing rumors that Barnes & Noble is having you know, difficulties financially because of uh, Amazon. So publishing in the United States is in a state of flux, and the largest publishers are worried about what's going to be happening in the future. And in the midst of all this is literature, which is, has uh, for many, many years been uh, a kind of stepchild in publishing. The publishers do literature out of a sense of obligation. So if cutbacks are going to be made within a publishing house, the cutbacks are going to be made in the area of literature. Now this presents a terrifying situation in one sense, but it's also a wonderful situation in another. There's a lot of room for small publishers to start doing interesting things, uh, doing authors, and books that never would have been available to them uh, years ago. And remarkably, a number of small presses have sprung up over the last five years doing translations in the US. So it's a interesting time uh, for publishing. And uh, how those books are going to get distributed throughout the United States uh, becomes another issue. In the last thing I really want to say, I'm going to, we'll plead with you to ask questions because I, the combination of Tokyo and this uh, cold uh, are going to limit me from going on. The um, electronic publishing, uh, where is that going to be in the future and how is it going to affect uh, literature? I'm one of those who likes to hold a book in its hands and uh, feel the paper. Uh, I've had an ongoing argument with, there's an author at the University of Illinois where I'm at named Richard Powers, who for years has been trying to convince me that the future of the book is uh, going to be electronic. 
and we've spent uh, a few long flights on airplanes together <coughs> with uh, uh, carrying on this argument. And I think it was five years ago. Uh, in fact, David Foster Walls, another novelist, and Rick Powers and I were traveling, and he pulled out one of these gadgets and started showing us what could be done. And David Wallace and I kept saying, yes, but it's different. You can't do this with it. And he would show us, yes, you can. And I'd say, well, you can't take notes in the margins. And I liked it. And he started putting the notes in the margins. Uh, so David and I just shut up at a certain point, trying to find there must still be some reason. And the last time I saw Rick, we had the usual argument. And the last thing I could fall back upon was, you can't turn the pages. And I like turning pages. And he pulled out his latest gadget and showed how he can turn the pages. So once again, I just shut up. I didn't want to say, OK, you're right. Um, I'm finally admitting to it. I've yet to read a book in this form. What are the possibilities, though, of uh, this? We now are getting rights when we buy the rights to books. We're getting the electronic rights. And some remarkable things have started to uh, happen. With electronic rights, the book in English now becomes available throughout the world. And it's not dependent upon the bookstore. Uh, it's available at any time. And it's available in a variety of editions. So if you do not like uh, the point size, or if you do not like the typeface that it's in, uh, you can adjust it, change it. Uh, make your own book. The, we're on the verge now of being able to print out these books. In fact, I, despite my reservations about this revolution, I wrote an article about 12 years ago projecting what the future was going to be of the book. And uh, one of the arguments I made was that we'll be able to sit in our living rooms, be it, print out a book on whatever quality paper we want, whatever size we want and then have some kind of binding machine that will allow us to print in our favorite cover. So whatever color combination you want for your home. So if it's burgundy and you want all of your books in burgundy, you'll be able to do that. That is now upon us. Uh, uh, the um, technology is there to allow us to do it. If you're going to go on insisting you want it in book form, and you can do this at any time. You don't have to wait for the library to open or a Libris and see if they're going to have the book, or even wait for the 24 hours for Amazon to uh, deliver it. For me, it's an exciting possibility of having so many books available and the possibilities of taking advantage of the fact that English is the dominant language, that we're going to be able to reach the entire world with English editions. In the last few years, a number of countries have come to us with because of our translations. The most recent has been there's a publisher in Turkey that wanted to translate a book that we had published from Finnish. They had nobody who could read Finnish at their publishing house. And so they could not read the book until we came out with our English language edition. This is the case throughout the world, that uh, books can be read in English, and publishers then can proceed to have them translated into uh, their own language. At times, and this is a bit scary, they use our English translation as the basis for doing their translation, which means your translation had better be very, very good. Uh, otherwise, you're just further corrupting what the original was. I like to think our translations are that good. But the English language, it's a way of taking advantage of and exploiting the fact of something that's oftentimes an embarrassment for me in traveling. Everybody knows English and have had to make the adjustment to it, that now we have the possibility for creating a worldwide community of readers so that uh, people in India, China, are not isolated from what's being done in the rest of the world because of language barriers. And through electronic editions of books, they're going to have access to anything that has been translated into English. If you have publishers who are dedicated to doing these kinds of books, and if you have a generation of translators coming along who are ready to undertake the difficulties of the art of translation. So 
please questions about publishing, about writing, about writers. Uh, I have 10,000 anecdotes to be sharing. Yes, please. In commercial publishing was economic. Uh, they were just selling fewer. Uh, a few years ago, Eastern European literature was getting widely translated, as was Russian literature, up until the wall came down. Almost all of Eastern European fiction went out of print overnight in the United States because it was no longer politically relevant. And who's going to be interested? Who's going to be buying it? It disappeared from the scene. We were able to pick up works of fiction and reprint them that uh, by major, major figures uh, in the literary world because commercial publishers decided nobody's going to be interested in Russia now. Uh, and nobody's going to be interested in Eastern Europe, so let the books go out of print. And some of these were major prize winners, Nobel Prize winners. The, it was, it's economics. Uh, Random House. We were talking about this in the, the Tokyo conference. Random House feels as though it has to sell 15,000 copies of a book in order to break even. If you're doing a highly literary book from, let's say, Estonia, what are the possibilities in the United States you're going to find 15,000 readers for this book just to break even? Not very likely or not anytime soon. So the book isn't done. And I, I don't have any argument with commercial publishing. If it's run as a business. It may not be run very well as a business because commercial publishers usually don't make very much money. But it is conceived along a um, business model. These kinds of works, so works of poetry, works in translation, just do not sell well enough to justify being done by a commercial house. The small presses then step in, but they're all underfunded. They don't have the kind of economic resources to be able to influence reviewers. Uh, they don't have the oh, what potential. I, I could get into describing the kind of corrupt corruption that exists in the book review media throughout the country uh, that ensures that a certain book is going to get reviewed and other books aren't going to get reviewed. Uh, if, if you want me to, I will describe it. Uh, but if you're a small publisher, you know that Random House is going to have a much better chance of getting a certain review in the New York Times than we'll be able to influence the New York Times to make sure that book gets reviewed and begin to project sales based upon that. Uh, in the small press that's doing a book of poetry or translation you know, doesn't have the resources create that kind of influence with the New Yorker, with Blanket Monthly, or Harper's, or the New York Times. So the burden has fallen to small houses to do these books without having the economic resources to uh, promote them the way that a random house could do if it thought it could sell this number of copies. Uh, the, that figure of 15,000 is probably, this is a figure I picked up from an editor at Random House five years ago. That number is probably now up to twenty to twenty-five thousand. So it's not a, it's not out of disinterest uh, on the part of New York houses uh, that they don't want to hear what's going on in the rest of the world. It's just a recognition of America. It's going to be much easier to do a book by an American uh, with a, on some kind of relevant subject rather than this wonderful obscure experimental novel coming from Estonia or Lithuania. That's the basis for pure economics. Oh, you get that part of it. The, um, I, happy people don't start things, though. Um, the, uh, they're too busy being happy, I think. It's, uh, it's, God, how do you describe this? I know so many of these people, uh, and they're all called founders. The Mellon Foundation funded us for about seven years, and they funded eight other publishers. And during the seven-year period, 
they uh, started talking about the founder syndrome. And the Mellon Foundation, along the way, decided something has to be done with the founders, and they were dealing with the founders. And so it was an unpleasant, um, awkward situation because the founders, you know, people who were kind of driven and a bit crazy. Otherwise, they never would have started doing the things they did. The, um, the personalities may have differed, but they all started with there's something wrong and they're going to do something about it. Uh, but they all uh, took extreme pleasure in doing what they're doing. Uh, so that came along with it. And there's nothing, I, for me, there's two times a year in which I get absolute delight out of what I do. And that's when our catalogs come out. And I look at them and I think I'd be so envious if some other publisher were doing these books. Uh, so that's a point of joy. The rest of it is you know, you know, hard work and uh, doing all kinds of other things. But the, the, there's enormous pleasure out of it. Uh, Publishing is an ideal profession for people with uh, attention deficit disorder. <laughs> the, uh, every day there are new problems and new crises, and uh, you never can plan a day. It's, it used to be, well, uh, the day would start when the phone rang, now it doesn't ring, it's email. Uh, and you never know what a particular day is going to be. So a day will start off with some email from Europe that uh, uh, the London Times is going to be doing this big review of this book. So whatever you're planning on doing for that day, it's now something else. So anyone here, uh, those of you younger who have attention deficit disorder, believe me, it's a career for you. It's the <laughs> perfect kind of job to get involved in. Somebody else. They've tried to. There's been some efforts. Uh, the Soros Foundation, George Soros, was funding publishing houses in Eastern Europe to do that. They couldn't break it out of their countries, though. Uh, so they were publishing in English, let's say in the Czech Republic, to be read by Czechs, which is an odd situation because they could read in the original. Uh, and the publishing houses weren't able to tap into distribution systems outside of the country, so the books weren't getting circulated outside of the country. Oh, it's pr primarily economic ones again. The, um, the United States and the UK pretty much control the distribution of books throughout the world. Uh, there's a few major companies that uh, do it. So, but it was an odd situation. The translations oftentimes weren't very good because they were being done by people for whom English was a second language. But there was that attempt. Right now there's a strange thing that goes on, well, throughout the, rest, throughout the world. The English language no, uh, novel will come out since everybody's reading English. A country, uh, the last time I was in um, uh, the Netherlands, this came up with the bookstore, that they have to hurry up and do a translation within a month uh, into their language because otherwise there'll be no market. The book's going to be read in English. So they had to be getting the book into Dutch within a month of publication in the U.S. Otherwise, there is no market for the Dutch book. And this is happening with a lot of countries. And the U.S. is beginning to affect publishing in the rest of the world because of if a book is in English and originally written in English, uh, everybody can read English. So publishers are being, who have depended upon translation from English into their home languages are beginning to have real problems because of uh, uh, the readers in their country read English and would prefer to be using the English original. It's one of the kind of nice ways in which English is uh, getting used, but it's causing those kinds of problems. So, get a
that's a whole world that I mean, my younger staff loved. And I had no idea uh, up until really this past year what they were. And I assumed that they were just some version of comic books. Uh, and I had no idea you know, why anybody who seemed to have a very literate background was interested in them until a few were forced upon me. And you know, it's a very interesting kind of literature that's coming out, th again, throughout the world. Yeah, it's. Um, Can you You're going to describe it. You you can do it better than I can, I'm sure. A graphic novel. Drawings, yeah. <laughs> I've seen book form. That, that's all that I've seen it in. The and it's first rate writing. That that's what amazed me about it. I, I, I was reading a novel, uh, and I realized I was reading a novel. Now, since I was so dismissive of this with younger staff, of why are you reading these comic books? As I kept calling them, uh, and I started reading. Uh, the ones that they were reading. And I thought that this is very, very interesting stuff. And it's a different form. Uh, but the crispness of the language, uh, the kind of uh, oh, playfulness that goes on, because they're being written by people with deep literary backgrounds. So there's a lot of intertextual kinds of things going on in them as well. Yes, sir. Elaborate so I can give you some kind of. Are you really speaking in a le legal sense of no, trademark? I really don't. It, it's uh, uh, what foreign concepts of what I'm usually up against. Uh, it, I'm usually dealing with like the opposite kinds of uh, problems rather than it's yeah. That's uh, the kinds of authors that we're dealing with. The something came up in Japan, for instance, again the English language that uh, Japanese authors are willing to pay to have their books translated. That uh, English language is so important. Uh, and so it's the English appropriating the rest of the world. And oftentimes having to change, uh, and you try to do this as minimally as possible, 
you're translating not just the language, you're translating a culture. And oftentimes, in doing that and having to have it make sense in the new culture, you're having to violate the original. So for the sake of creating a parallel experience for the new reader. Uh, yeah, no, well, that's the ongoing fight. It's, um, with translators, uh, it's a constant one. And our view in doing a translation is, uh, and it's, you could say it's just playing with words, but it is to create a parallel experience so that the new reader in the new language is going to experience something very similar to what the original reader did. In order to achieve that, though, you oftentimes have to violate the original. And an example of it is if, if the original reader did not have difficulty with a certain sentence, uh, or a certain reference. Why should the reader in the new language have difficulty? So a translator who's been uh, brought up in a traditional translation studies theory program will fight this concept. They'll say that that's um, uh, violating the original text and that nothing really can be changed. So things that will come out uh, as obscure if they do come out obscure in the English language, that's fine. And I think it's a violation of what the author was up to. Uh, if, if that wasn't a problem, the original. And I wonder if it's ever gotten that extreme. Well, the, the typical situation is puns are very, very difficult to translate, uh, and jokes can be very difficult. And the really good translators will say, there's no way I can do it in this paragraph, but I owe one to the author. So if I can pick up another pun somewhere else on the page, uh, I'm going to do it in that way. But it's just the pun and the reference, social and cultural reference, just isn't going to work. So you try to find a parallel. This is oftentimes done with the original author. So it's, uh, the translator will go back to the original author and they'll work on it together. And the author's agreeing, yeah, that's right. This, there's no way of making this uh, work. There's a novel that we published a number of years ago that the very first line would have been confusing to Americans it was an inside joke uh, about the French and Belgium. The, the French don't care very much about Belgium. And it was, but it was a joke that Americans couldn't possibly get. It was uh, talking, well, it was a reference to weather, it was a reference to Belgium being cheap. And it was done in such a way that you, you weren't even sure that that's what it was about, but it was known between Belgians and the French what the author was doing. Now, how do you translate that into English? Well, it was nearly an incomprehensible opening sentence in English, and any reader would have been stopped right there, You'd have lost. Well, what, uh, what the hell's going on in this sentence? It was not a problem when the book was published in France. People got it and just proceeded to the next sentence. So what do you do with that when you're bringing it into English? Are you trying to stop the reader from con continuing to read? We came up with another way of putting down the Belgians than, uh, than the reference that was being used there. And then check with the author. We said, this just isn't going to work. So we 
gave the author a few possibilities. And he said, okay, he said, that, that's, that's a good way of attacking them as well. So, uh, <laughs> Man. My laptop got dry yesterday, so I have to do my I think it's going to be great. We'll be able to sell far more copies uh, at a lower price. And my concern is the reader. Uh, but the author is going to also make more money on such sales. Uh, we'll be able to sell at a lower price. Right now in publishing, nobody knows what the pricing is. Right. People in publishing know that they don't have the overhead attached to them that you do with uh, print. But maybe you can bamboozle readers into thinking you still should pay twenty two ninety five for this. I guess Amazon now is selling electronic books. Everything is nine ninety. Uh, which is probably still too high, uh, but it should be much cheaper. And uh, again, this variety of formats I think is just going to be so. Oh, around the office, I'll look at books that are given to me in galleys, and I'll say, "Why are we using such a small typeface for this book?" Well, it's the same typeface we were using ten years ago, but my eyes have changed in those ten years, and. Uh, we've always have gone with, I forget what it is, whether it's 12 point uh, is a general standard for us. And, well, I can't read 12 point the way I used to. And with an electronic version, I don't have to. I can go up to 16 point if I want to. Uh, keep adjusting it to whatever I want. We can't do that with, now I'm starting to argue on behalf of the enemy here, and I don't want to. Um, That's been, oh, they, they don't appear on television any longer, but uh, going back just a few years, Xerox would have a professor standing in front of a class describing publishing and that uh, you, know, you have to learn how to deal with a publisher. And some student raises his hand and says, I don't. I publish my own book. Well, Xerox doesn't run that ad any longer. Uh, Self-published books still, and I think will continue to uh, carry the earmark of being self-indulgent product that uh, uh, has not yet been approved by somebody. The, the role of a publisher, I think, is really twofold. It's gatekeeper, and I think it's going to continue to be that. Secondly is editing, and the third role is really promotion. Uh, those are the three, and they've always been, the three key things that a publisher is uh, doing, saying, this deserves to be published, and this other thing doesn't. And it doesn't mean publishers are right uh, in making that decision. But then editing, how to make the book as good as it can be. And then the third role is promoting it. Uh, and that, those three things have remained constant. Uh, Self-published books, Amazon will carry them. Uh, there's no market for them. Every once in a while, a self-published book will break through because it should have been published by somebody. It had you know, commercial potential, and it's very difficult to get commercial publishers to pay attention to your submission. So some people have done self-published books that then a large New York house discovers and picks up and publishes in a conventional way. But that role of the publisher, I think, is going to remain constant. And it's, going, it's a kind of imprimatur uh, for a book that some editor 
have decided this book should be published. And, uh, and then is doing the kind of promotional thing to uh, help support it. Uh, I just don't see that as changing. And it, and it, and it kind of defies reason. You, you would think that if you have something that's really good uh, and you make it available, why aren't people going to pay attention to it uh, just because it hasn't come to a publisher? Uh, you would think people would. But if you want to go out and read everything that has been made available in print, or do you want a, some kind of guidance going on that uh, a legitimate publisher has decided this book should be done? Uh, but also just finding out about the book. It's incredibly hard to find out about books unless somebody is out really uh, pushing and pushing to bring it to your attention. It's, they, they've tried. I, um, Stephen King attempted, this goes back to the issue of the publisher again. Mm -hmm. Stephen King attempted to bypass his publisher, I think it's about 10 years ago, said, uh, why not just do it himself and make it available chapter by chapter and, and he'd stop after a few chapters. Uh, and he was offering it at a very reasonable price and people just were not buying. Uh, in the kinds of quantities that they would have been buying had the book come out in the conventional form from uh, the publisher. The, um, you have a lot of independent publishers, and they keep springing up, and it's amazing to me that they do, because the deck is so stacked against uh, new publishers now. But they keep popping up, and they're really the alternative. Uh, and they do the, the groundwork and the grunt work to, for the publication of the book, and I think writers is probably a mistake for them to get involved in the awfulness of publishing, the kinds of things you have to do. Writers don't want to have to be worrying about warehousing problems and how to deal with FedEx. And, uh, uh, the it, it works up to a point, but books are a strange kind of commodity to be uh, dealing with. And you don't have a lot of the outlets, technological outlets. But, um, uh, but it's, it's possible with electronic books that, um, that other alternative publishers could start popping up that are really being run by um, authors themselves. Although we don't have a great model of the success of co-op publishing with authors, so they tend not to get along very well. <laughs> and maybe they do in other art forms. Authors tend not to. The attempts to form collectives uh, with authors always been a difficult one. Somebody else? Um, how hard or easy is it, is it to find the people that can actually do the same thing? Uh, it's, um, how many hours do we have here? <laughs> the, it's, the, the quick one is, there's a shortage of really good translators. Uh, and it's, uh, and especially with certain languages. The best translators, one, are getting older and older, and there's not a new generation coming along. Uh, it's thankless work. You usually uh, have to have a day job to go along with it. You're not paid well as a literary translator. Uh, and it's, it's really an art. It's, it's not just knowing the language. Uh, so it can be difficult finding the right translator for the uh, for a particular book, and especially if it's an obscure language. It's something that, and I, something I think universities should be taking responsibility for, is developing new generations of translators and making their lives a bit easier. Uh, right now in academia, it's a big issue with the Modern Language Association that they're going to be raising in the next year, and that is translations historically do not count towards promotion in academia. Uh, it doesn't count as creative work and it doesn't count as scholarly work. And in my view, it's both. And it should be counted as both. We have a number of very good translators who are in academia who at times will tell us, there's one, 
just recently from Harvard, that I can't translate for the next three years because I have to churn out some what he called third grade articles uh, in order to get promotion. Uh, and he knew that his really good work is translation work, but what's going to get him promotion is the usual kind of uh, academic book and articles. So, got to in academia. It's it's where it has to change. And uh, there's been a lot of complaining going on about it. And uh, oh, through one of our publications, we've been doing it a lot and trying to raise it as an issue in the profession. And Modern Language this year has announced that uh, next year's convention is going to be a large part of it's going to be devoted to translations. And that's one of the major issues. Uh, so I, I, I think translators are threats to conventional academics in many ways. Uh, that uh, it's, it's seen as fun work to do, and anybody can do it. We, and it's neither of those. Uh, so it, it should be counted, as I say, creative work and scholarly work. And that would help the situation. But also just creating translators, having programs at universities that are turning out translators. And nobody's doing it right now. Thank you.